on Monday, we're back to teaching and my station will be covering the anatomy of the brainstem, um, a topic <laughs> as terrifying to teachers as it is to students, I think. Knowledge is a funny thing. Um, you've probably seen me teach things that I've completely forgotten that I've taught. I have taught so many sessions, I've made so many videos, and the sessions that I teach are not always the same. They vary, I do this, that, and whatever for all sorts of different courses and swap with other people. And so many times I'm giving a session to teach and I'll say, oh, I haven't done that before. I'll need to go and prepare something. But when I go and check my notes, I have copious notes and presentations and collections of images because I've taught it before and I've completely forgotten. Knowledge is a funny thing. The knowledge and understanding is in there and it comes back quickly when I start reading through my notes. I just don't remember often the actual teaching episode. But the teaching has caused that knowledge and understanding to happen, to be embedded in my brain, so that when refreshed, I can pull it out. If you're a student with us at Swansea University, you'll know that this is something I harp on about quite a bit. Um, teaching should be part of your learning. Uh, how do you go about that? There are two ways to go about this. Uh, we do peer-to-peer -peer teaching or near-peer teaching, which sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but is a very common idea in modern educational theory. Ooh, sound a bit researchy there. Um, we get, for example, year two students to teach year one students. But how can a year two student know enough to teach a year one student? Surely you need a qualified doctor. Well, there's a couple of things going on. One, if you've learnt it, you should have learnt it well enough to be able to teach it. And secondly, a near peer teacher has gone through the experience of learning this material once and they are closer to the learner than, say, a consultant doctor is. They remember what the learning experience is, they remember what the difficulties were so they can ameliorate those. They can teach what needs to be taught at the level that it needs to be taught at. When you're a long way away from learning that subject matter, teachers often add in a lot of unnecessary de detail. So near-peer teaching. Also, uh, <laughs> if you're gonna do some near-peer teaching, well, you're gonna stand up and teach your near-peers, uh, which is a terrifying prospect. Um, fear is a motivation for learning is quite a good one but if you're going to stand up in front of this group of people and teach them something well you really want to feel like you know that topic so students will then read around the topic they'll understand it in greater depth in better detail they'll learn more than they need to learn to be able to teach that bit that they need to teach their knowledge will be wider and deeper can you see so they're learning their understanding is going to be better right because when they're stood doing the teaching they don't want to look like an idiot they want to be accurate, they want to be reliable, um, and they want to get that, that reward a teacher gets when they feel like they've done a good job. When we do near-peer teaching, I actually encourage the weaker students to become near-peer teachers rather than the stronger students. The weaker students gain much more from this than a student that's already strong. Does that make sense now from what I've described? The thing I harp on about the most though is as part of your weekly learning, try to do a little bit of your learning as part of a group. And if you have a comfortable group of friends, this works best. So um, working as a group, um, you should be teaching each other error correcting each other, looking things up together. So as a group, you will be more accurate, but because you're teaching each other, you'll have these learning experiences that embed this knowledge in your brain. Your understanding will be deeper, your knowledge will be better, um, your knowledge will be more accurate, but also you'll be using the language of anatomy. So language is very much about practice and using the words, right? And the more you use the words, the more you say them out loud, the more you teach each other and talk to each other and question each other, 
the easier the recall of those words is. And for us, anatomy gets assessed everywhere, but in the anatomy spot where you have a physical thing, I stick in a pin in it and ask you, what is the name of that and what does it do? You gotta remember the name of it. So language recall, word recall is a big part of that, recognition and recall. This will work best if you can find yourself a comfortable group of friends. This might be just three of you. Could, you could do it in pairs. Maybe there's a group of five of you. Um, but if you're comfortable making mistakes with one another, that's important because making mistakes is part of learning. I remember learning episodes from when I was doing my degree 30 years ago, um, where these sorts of things happened. And I still remember that bit of anatomy accurately because of that learning experience is the little stories that we store inside our brains. Um, and then I'm, so I'm, I'm more confident in my knowledge because I can remember that teaching episode that will make no sense to anybody else. There's no point in me explaining it to you, but it just sits inside my head. And uh, it works for me, right? <music>have to teach the anatomy of the brainstem and I'm looking forward to it. My knowledge and understanding is much better than it would have been if I hadn't made all these brainstem reflex videos. I already had a reasonable understanding beforehand but having to put that extra time in to teach and um, because I'm doing this solo I've been error correcting myself and looking at many many resources to make sure I'm getting it right. I'm confident in my knowledge and my ability to teach this. Um, so that's my top tip for 2024 is to teach.